Hi, good evening. Crime Watch live and interactive, the show where you can change the outcome. Tonight, the small town, the strange visitor, the rape, and the clues to find him. The pretend postman who turned out to have a gun, but not much of a brain. A missed taxi, so who did meet Hugh Cameron? The mystery of how a night at the pub finished with a body in a river. Great Harwood in East Lancashire is a pretty small town where everyone knows everyone, but no one seems to know the man who hung around at night just before and after Christmas. Three or four months later, people there are still very keen to find out who he is. It was always 20 past 12. I were in a bit of early. So I turned into Willow Street and just as I came in and swung round, this fella come out and I jammed my brakes on. And I'm, I was only a foot from hitting him. He was just face onto me. If he'd have been wet, I'd have knocked him down. I'd have hit him. Well, I was just looking through the back window about uh, quarter to 12 and I I think it was. And I saw this uh, young person standing between the garages. I thought he was a peeping Tom, because they were looking up at the window for quite a while. And then he walked slowly up the back, very slowly. And then he got into a car, a Fiesta, a Nova or something like that, an old car. And then he drove off toward Blackburn Road. I was coming home, it was about 20 past nine. I as soon as my car headlights hit him, he turned straight to the wall. You don't expect to see anybody so close to the houses, only the people that live there. There's no reason for anybody to be round the back. Three twenty change. Thanks. Bye. So what time did you get in on Thursday then? About three. Couldn't stay awake at college. Nearly went to sleep in the afternoon. Before the attack, I was a student at college. I used to go out every weekend without fail. I was always partying and doing sports and I at my boyfriends a lot and I was just a happy 17-year-old, really. Right, I'll see you next week then. Yeah, have a good weekend. I wish I'd put a jacket on. I told you we should have waited for a taxi. Yeah, we could have been waiting ages. Outside the pub. I'll see you in two minutes. He used a Nokia with a light blue case, but the couple weren't convinced he was really on the phone to anyone. Hiya. I'm double glazing. Is your dad in? No, he's working, but he'll be back soon. Well, is your mum in, then? Yeah. She's upstairs. We'll give her a call with you. I want to speak with her. She's a bit busy at the minute. Well, can I come back later and speak to your mum and dad? It's a bit late. Can you call back tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to hurt you, but if you scream, I'll kill you. I've just watched you get changed from back. The intruder guessed the mother wasn't really in the house and raped the girl. I can't really go anywhere. I, I depend on everybody. Um, I'm like a little child. I can't sleep on my own. I can't go upstairs on my own. If I get up at night to go to the toilet, I have to wake somebody up to come with me. I just feel like I can't do anything that I used to do. I can't ever imagine life being like it used to be. Neil, it's so distressing, but at least you've got E-fits, um, and not bad E-fits. 
No, we're, we're pleased with the EFIT, Nick. We've shown it to the victim and she says that uh, there was a particular reaction from her. She was very pleased with the likeness of the offender. Had you got DNA too? We have, yes. And I would encourage anybody this evening to ring in if they have any suspicions about their partners, lovers, boyfriends, husbands. We've got the process to eliminate anybody through a quick, simple and painless process. And if they have got any suspicions, please ring in tonight. And just point, let's point the other clues as well. He's got this small red car, at least he did on January the 19th. Yes, one of the witnesses saw a peeping Tom walk away from the back of the house, uh, along a back alley, uh, turned left to a red vehicle. He's quite sure it was a red vehicle. It was an old Fiesta or Nova type vehicle. This person got into the vehicle and drove away towards Blackburn Road. Now the profiler is anxious that this guy may do this again may have done something like it in the past, may have been a peeping Tom uh, in the past, but you don't have him on the sex offenders register. He's not, his DNA hasn't come up. No, he isn't. And I think the profiler was uh, keen to, to uh, uh, stress that because the particular method that he used was a well-practiced deception. He may well have used that before the attack. What, saying he's a double glazing salesman? Yes, he may well have used it after the attack. It was pretty well-practiced and it may well be that people have thrown the door, slammed the door in his face and it may well be that he's uh, got intimate knowledge of the double glazing thousands industry. of people will have met double glazing salesmen at the door. You're saying only somebody who looks like this and who really aroused their suspicions. Yes, that's right. Um, it, it may well be that if he's used that in the past, we would like to hear from them. Though not necessarily in this area, because of course he, hasn't been, he wasn't known in the village and he hasn't been seen since. No, we had eight or nine sightings of somebody at the back of the house and it's quite interesting that we've not had a sighting since and it may well be that the person was living in the area and has since left. He used the name Peter, probably not his real name, but again, of course, it, it, if he's really got some obsession, he's playing out some fantasy, he might well have used that name before. Yes, it could be an alias, it could be a significant name that he's used in his life, it could be his brother's, father's name. OK, Saturday 19th of January, it's the Manchester United Blackburn Rovers match, if that helps stir memories. If you've got an idea who this is, it's easy to eliminate, as you've heard, just give us a call. This is where the top detectives are tonight. Uh, or you can call any time on this one, the incident room on 01 254 353 353. If you're sitting watching this in a pub, take a look around you and then take a look at this man. Three months ago when he was out drinking, he did something so savage, it seems he must have done it before and it's quite likely he'll do it again. It was a completely and totally unprovoked attack. A person like Malcolm doesn't deserve that to happen to them. Nobody deserves that to happen to them. The Penny Farthing's actually a brilliant pub to go into. It's a gay bar. It's a um, fantastic atmosphere at all times. Never been in trouble since I've been here. Um, just a great pub to go into, basically. A friend of mine was actually doing a karaoke down there. I arrived at the Penny about 20 past seven. I looked over and noticed this, uh, this man. I specifically noticed him because of the jumper he was wearing. It was a grey jumper with a grey and white Union Jack design on the front. At some point during the night, I think it was around about nine-ish, quarter past nine, they asked me to dance. And I got up and I started dancing with him. But he got bit too much, he was actually pushing too much and uh, for it being quite forceful but not being hurtful and I sat down. On the penny in the evening I went in first off with my housemates and two of our other friends who are local to the gay community around here. Good thing then, no. I got him. No. You, did you did it yesterday, and it was <laughs> got on the Carly number. Out okay, alright, alright. Oh, okay. Okay. It was just a happy, relaxed atmosphere and smiles on everybody's faces. The karaoke, just having a good old birthday drink and just doing what everybody does. Um, I went up to the bar, um, introduced myself to Malcolm, who was beside me. Um, he introduced me to himself. We got on really well. I thought he's a really funny guy, absolutely brilliant guy. Um, we just started basically talking, basically having a laugh. And it was at that point that the chap with the jumper on, I noticed him get up quite, I don't know, deliberately. It just happened <laughs> so quickly, a brush on my shoulder, turn around. And I heard this awful crack. 
and I wasn't looking at a punch, I was looking at the results of somebody putting a glass in his face. In the chaos that resulted, he casually walked out into Hammersmith's King Street. Take a look at him again. Not a man you'd want to have a drink with. I, I had my hands against my face and I just remember the blood rushing down my fingers and through my hands and down on my T-shirt. I seriously thought that was my life gone. And they had to operate on my eye um, because I was told there was still two or three splinters in the, the surface of my eye. I've got like four scars on my face and visually impaired in my right eye. Or oh, what for? Nothing. In fact, you know, he's lost his job because he can't see properly. Who was that man? He had a husky Scottish accent and that distinctive Union Jack top and he had a, a number one on the back. You know our number, it's on the screen. Call us. Quite a few calls coming in. Instantly, I've just seen a couple coming in on Millie Dowler, the missing Surrey schoolgirl. I'll tell you a little more about that case in, in just a moment and show you some of her possessions. And incidentally, if uh, you recognise these items, you may lead police to a violent sex offender. Also in a moment, the pretend postman who got in, but then couldn't get out. How do I get out of here? How do I open the gates? Press the button by the phone. And if you live in Huddersfield, maybe you can make sense of how a puncture led to a murder. But first, one case that might be a lot easier to solve than those ones is the head of Sussex CID, Detective Chief Superintendent Jeremy Payne. Increased security around railway stations means we've been able to retrieve CCTV pictures which could solve an attack. A young woman was grabbed late at night outside King's Cross Railway Station in London, dragged into an alleyway and sexually assaulted. Now, although brief, these are clear pictures of the man they need to speak to. Who is he? 0500 600 600. Someone out there, hopefully, he's watching now, is ready to shop a villain. But when he first rang the police, he wanted a reward. There wasn't one. Well, there is now, and whoever calls first can claim it. It was a normal Monday morning. I got up, put my dressing yeah, gown on, went straight into my office. I was on the phone to my friend. That was my morning until I was interrupted. A ride will go. Oh, hang on, there's somebody at the door. Hang on a minute, darling. I've got a registered letter for you. OK, hang on, I'll be right down. I have to go. Call you back. Bye. When I went out to take the package, I had no reason to believe that he was not a postman. He was dressed in the postman's outfit, and I didn't give it a second thought. Hi. What have you got for me? I've got this package for you, but uh, I need you to sign for it. Oh. We are, we've got a new uh, procedure now. I need uh, to see some ID, please. Oh, OK. I'll go and get something. All right, David. When he came through the door, he was very motivated. He knew exactly what he was doing. Give me your hand. Look, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to rape you. I okay. can't. As we progressed through what was happening, right. he was getting more and more panicky. Right, you. Sit there. And stay there. All right. Oi! Oi! No, no! Go on, get down. Ah. Get down. Get your hands. A bit tired this time, shall we? Oh. Right. Oh. Up. Oh. Go on. Through there. Sit there. Oh. And this time, don't move, all right? I was sat, sat back down on the kitchen stool and he put a mask on his face. And I just thought he was trying to frighten me with that and just stay calm. He then got the gun out. Look, I don't want to hurt you. And I'm not going to rape you. I just want money and jewellery. OK, OK, I'll, I'll give you what you want. Right then, come on. Uh, I said, oh, I've got some cash upstairs. And he then sort of frog marched me upstairs. Uh, right, where's the money? It's in there, in the basket under the newspaper.
I could see that he was starting to get agitated and panicky. I want more jewellery. I had a crossing chain round my neck which he ripped off. He ripped off a ring from my finger. Oh, no, please, not that one. That was my mother's. It's not worth very much, but it means a lot to me. Yeah, don't lay that one on me. Come on, there's got to be more money in this place. Come on, downstairs. <laughs> You must have more stuff in this house. Antiques everywhere. He thought that we had uh, lots of money and lots of jewellery at the house, which we don't have. John owes a lot of people a lot of money. He said that my husband owed people money, which isn't true, and it, it was like it was his excuse for doing what he was doing. Come on, let's go back upstairs. There must be some more up there. Right, get in there. Oh. Lie down there, face down. Oh. There wasn't any chance for me at all while I was laying on the bed. At this stage, I did feel very, very vulnerable, so I sat myself up. At that point, I tried to hit the burglar alarm. He then hit me over the head with a gun. I want more money and more jewellery. I'm going to count to three, right? One. It's in the office. Right. Come on, then. Sit down there. Oh, oh, my friends will be here in a minute. Now, where's the money? Up there. Right. Uh, Come on, get down there. Down there. Uh, down there. Stay there. Uh, he ran downstairs and I got up. I heard my car start up and I could see that he was reversing out. I think I'm quite a strong person and I just feel that this person won't get the better of me. He kept saying to me that you're being an awkward lady and I just felt that I want, just want, if I wanted to stand up to him. The thing about this case, Andrew, is, is it would almost be funny, you know, if he hadn't been so violent. I mean, what are we to make of this business with the mask? He comes in without a mask, then he puts the mask on as if he wants to disguise himself, then he takes it off again. We don't know. We, we think he may have just panicked, or it may be that he's not an experienced criminal who started off with a very serious offence. And what about this? I mean, I don't know how much you can tell at home, but this, all this is is a, is a cardboard tube with some wrapping paper around it. And he wanted to use this so much, he left it outside, he, he actually went out uh, to get it and come back in the house again. What on earth was he thinking he was going to achieve with this? We have absolutely no idea. Uh, it, as you say, he went outside to get it, but he actually left it behind. And if anybody's seen this or if anybody helped make it, please get in touch. Well, what, what do we know about him? We, we do know that he's very like the actor who played him in the reconstruction. The lady who was robbed said the, the robber was a little younger than the actor and uh, not quite as heavily built. He has staining at the front of his teeth and obviously the very distinctive ponytail. Now, he, he didn't get away with that much. That's why he was so persistent in saying, to them, well, you must have more money, you must have more jewellery. Um, in terms of jewellery, he took um, one quite distinctive thing. There's this uh, snake-type bracelet here, and what it was a necklace, wasn't it, he took, that's that, right. that matches this? It, it's a matching set. The necklace is exactly the same, only larger. Where is that necklace? Has anybody given it to you as a present, perhaps? And then um, he tried to make a getaway. In fact, of course, then he very nearly didn't get away because he couldn't work out how to get out of the gates. But then he only went, what, a couple of hundred yards? He, he went 200 yards and p abandoned the car in the car park of Haberdasherest School. It was 10.45 on the 10th of September. That's the day before the terrorist attack at the World Trade Centre. Did you see that car being abandoned? Did you see him making off in any other car? OK, well, as I said before, there's the, someone who called in before but wasn't too keen to give any information because there wasn't a reward at the time. There is a reward now. It's a big reward. But if you want to call in, you better do so fast because the first person who calls in with the information will get the reward. The number is 0500 600 600 or you can call 01707 638 233.
This is part of a profiler's report of the man at the centre of our next appeal. Listen to this. The level of violence in his methodology means that he's likely to offend again. He has probably graduated from small-time crime. His awareness of forensics means that these are unlikely to be his first sex crimes. He's likely to have a history of violence. His confidence indicates he has a bolt hole locally. We'll explain what we mean by locally in a moment. He's likely to be late 20s to early 30s. He's dominant and experienced. He may be a trophy keeper. He took a bag, purses and a poetry book. He took me into the, the playground and um, I was just thinking that it was, it was really kind of macabre. It was really ironic that this kind of thing should be happening somewhere where you know, children were meant to be happy. There have been two attacks in Greenbank Park, one in April 2001 and one in November 2001, both by the same man and both on young students who actually live in the area. The first victim was attacked on Sunday the 29th of April 2001. It was in the early hours of the morning, about 6am in the morning, and she dropped her keys alongside Greenbank Park. She stooped to pick them up, and as she did so, a jogger ran past her. Was he really a jogger, or at 6.15am a year ago, was this the attacker? The second assault was late at night, on a student who'd taken a black cab home with friends but got out where they did because she didn't have the money to go on in the taxi alone. It should have been an easy five-minute stroll. And just as she got to the gates opposite Lord's Hospital on Greenbank Road, a male attacked her from behind, dragged her into Greenbank Park and subjected her to a serious assault. Um, I was just really scared, and because he was saying that it was, if I made a noise, he'd kill me. I, I was just sort of trying to remain calm. I just thought that he might be like taking me to some sort of horrible squat or something and I was going to be sort of trapped somewhere, but he didn't. He led me to the lake. Because of where the attack took place, the man would have been very muddy. Were you surprised when someone came home wet and muddy around 3.15am one morning last November? I had a handbag. It was like pink and white psychedelic pattern and it was my favourite bag. I had a poetry book in it. I said, I don't, I don't care if you take the bag, um, but could you leave my poetry book because it's very special um, and haven't got them written anywhere else. These are really ghastly attacks. If he is a trophy keeper, he may well have kept these things. This is a replica of the poetry book that um, the victim pleaded with him, please don't take, it's of no value, but it's got my poems in it. She's made another one for us. She thinks this is pretty much uh, identical. This handbag, this isn't the same material. She couldn't get the exact material, but this is very much like it. Have you seen anybody with this combination? Because if so, we would very much like to hear from you. 0500 600 600. Just tell you about some of the people that we have heard from so far tonight, at least some of the calls, uh, on that attack on the guy in, in the gay pub in, in West London who lost his eye. We've had two names that the uh, officers are really quite interested in that. And also then on the Great Harwood Rape, um, not a huge number of calls, but um, one in particular has intrigued me. Somebody has said that the EFIT is an absolute dead ringer for somebody, and he's given a name, he's given an address, and he says he's confident that that's the guy. And in fact, on that Hammersmith attack, we've got uh, another call here. Quite a lot of calls coming in on that. Uh, on our next appeal, we've not much evidence to go on, to be honest. But sometimes, these are the kinds of cases that we get our best results on. If you live in Huddersfield, maybe you can make sense of the very few clues there are. The victim was one of the founders of a garage that specialises in car electrics. His name was Brian Hardwick. Brian, he was a very loving, sensitive, hard-working, yeah, all his friends thought a lot about him. He was a guy that he got on with his life and he let people get on with their lives. We joined a club, which is every Friday, called the Range Riders. Everybody gets dressed up in the Western gear. We just fell in love with the place, you know, and we've just been going ever since. So Brian said, that's it, a Western wedding for us, and that's what we had. They married on the 12th of May last year, but only had six months together as husband and wife. Brian had worked as an auto electrician at Huddersfield Car Electrical Services on Colne Road for the last 23 years. He was very hard working, reliable, 
conscientious. Many a time, if you offered him a drink of tea, he wouldn't have one. He just wanted to get on and solve the problem as quickly and as efficiently as he possibly could. But he was always the first here and the last away. So maybe that was why it happened. On a Wednesday night five months ago, Brian was alone in the garage when he was shot. There are five clues. Can you piece them together to come up with the killer? As a colleague left work, he noticed that Brian's red Renault Clear was parked as usual in the car park outside the garage. Somebody had stabbed a tire on Brian's car and sometime after half past five, he'd moved it into the garage to change the wheel. Two people need to be eliminated. A white man in his 20s with piercing eyes, average height but stocky. And a black man who may have been sheltering from the rain. Whoever killed Brian shot him with a small calibre gun, a .22 weapon. Once in the chest, and after he fell, another shot in the head. Several personal possessions were stolen, and maybe theft was the motive. Where's the other half of this? Brian put it, the one half round my neck, and I put the other half round Brian's neck. I only wish I could have the other half back to put it together and then it would be complete. Two wallets were stolen, though they didn't have much in them. And so was a bunch of keys. Brian's cash card was used at the Lloyd's TSB cash dispenser at the Asda store on the Bradford Road. The transactions took all of seven minutes. It's a long time since November the 21st, but you'd remember someone taking seven minutes at a cash dispenser. Surely there's somebody out there that is, knows who's done it. And I just begged them to come forward and give names so that at least I can have an answer of why this has happened to Brian. Was it a robbery that went wrong? We can't be sure, and that's why we need your help. 0500 600 600 or 01484 436 702. And now, here's Detective Sergeant Jackie Hames with a few faces you might recognise. Three clips of CCTV, starting with clear pictures of an attack on a security guard. In January, a security guard was delivering money to a bank in the City of London. These two men followed him in and attacked him, snatching a large amount of cash. They escaped in a black Volkswagen Golf, leaving the 64-year-old guard very shaken. This man's first attempt at robbing an off-license was thwarted when other customers came in, but he came back when the shop was empty, pulled a knife on the assistant and demanded the contents of the till. He spoke with a Tyneside accent, do you know who he is? Last October, these two men got into an office building in Woking, Surrey. They helped themselves to computer equipment worth thousands of pounds. This man has a bandaged right hand. Do you know why? If you recognised any of these faces, call us now on 0500 600 600. Some feedback from last programme we did now. Some results, some disappointments and some that remain mystifying. The biggest response by far was on Millie Dowler, the missing teenager, who was ruled out this morning as the body recovered from the River Thames. So her disappearance remains one of the most baffling cases in Britain. As you may have seen, detectives have taken over 3,000 calls, a big proportion of those from Crime Watch viewers, and the senior officer, Alan Sharp, says he's extremely grateful. The answer might be in there, he says, but to check thoroughly that vast number is going to take time. On the night, one viewer thought he'd found Millie's purse. It turned out not to be hers. So here is the most detailed look yet at her possessions. And let's start. The purse, here's a replica of it. Pretty distinctive, that. The uh, Ace of Hearts, red zip down the front, white back. 
if you've seen that dumped anywhere, particularly anywhere near Walton on Thames in Surrey, please let us know. This is not distinctive. What we need for these other ones is if you found these in combination. First, uh, this bracelet, this little uh, elasticated red bracelet with these little, little beads on it. This uh, Jansport backpack, identical to one that she had. Again, there are lots of these. Don't want to know about one of these dumped unless it's under very suspicious circumstances in the area. But if you found it with some of these other items, like, for example, uh, her phone. This is a Nokia 3210. Now, actually, if it's found and is Millie's, you'll know it because not only silver on the front, blue on the back, but she had written in uh, black marker pane her name on the back of it there. And then there's her uniform, of course. This is what she was wearing. She wasn't actually wearing the, uh, the jumper at the time, but she was carrying it. Distinctive blue, white and black tie and, of course, the very uh, distinctive badge on the uniform. And these are uh, her shoes, uh, called uh, pod shoes. It's uh, perhaps improbable anybody will find those, but let's uh, give it a go. And please, the police think it's just possible that young people in the area have thoughts, have suspicions, perhaps feel they're too trivial or don't feel quite that they can call the police. Do please, just pluck up the courage to do so. You can call us here, and I, I promise you calls aren't traced here to the studio, 0500 600 600, or you can call the instant room on 01372 471212. Please, no hoax calls. Last time that we did an appeal for Millie, two or three rather sick women rang up pretending to be her. Please don't do that, this is far too serious. But if there's anything you think you know, call us, Call the instant room or call Crime Stoppers on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. On other cases, Anthony Kitchener was wanted for sex offences against children. Four viewers rang in with an address in Haffent in Hampshire. Local police went round straight away and he was arrested soon after the programme came off the air. He's been charged and is awaiting trial. David Bright was another face we showed last month, wanted for indecent assault and deception. A call here to the studio led to an address in Hastings, and he too has been arrested and charged. Some progress on a murder we featured from back in 1990. Paul Stevens may have been killed by a partner or as a result of a homophobic attack. As a result of calls, detectives traced one of the key witnesses but they think an even more important call came from the continent, a viewer called Tim. They make an open promise to deal with him with the utmost sensitivity. So please, Tim, if you want to do the right thing, please call back. We showed this artist's impression of a pregnant woman found murdered in a park in Kent. Though not as a result of Crime Watch, she's been identified as Sumia Cullinane, who came from Essex. Three men have been charged in connection with her murder. Mohammed Nadil Abbas was wanted on charges of rioting, but after he was on Crime Watch, he went to his local police station and he's now awaiting trial. These two are still out there, Zahir Abbas Bashir and Mohammed Shakil. They're both wanted in connection with violent crimes at the time of the disturbances in Bradford. We're getting some really, really good information in that, that, that all, all the phone lines are busy. I've just been handed these two uh, call sheets here. You remember the case of that uh, man who pretended to be a postman and broke in to, uh, to rob some money and some jewel? We've got two people here who've rung up independently, both with the same name, so that's looking very promising indeed. Uh, and we've also uh, a lot of different names on the Hammersmith glass attacks and very interesting calls on the Great Harwood rape. Coming up. A missed taxi. So who did meet Hugh Cameron? The mystery of how a night at the pub finished with a body in a river. Why does the man who could be Britain's most prolific sex offender only attack in the winter? And who's the mystery mule, a gullible or perhaps desperate woman who swallowed drugs to smuggle them and was found dead beside a motorway? First, some people caught on CCTV. An attempt was made to steal thousands of pounds from the account of someone who died. Cashiers at a bank in Benfleet, Essex, became suspicious, and this man left just before the police arrived. And who's this in a bank in Leicestershire? He was in there at the same time that over £2,000 was withdrawn using a stolen credit card. Whoever he is, he may be able to help with the investigation. 0500 600 600. The troubles in Northern Ireland are what hit the headlines. But even with all that, believe it or not, it's one of the safest places in Europe. So what happened to Hugh Cameron? Mm -hmm. 
Maybe they were very rare. Uh, Party, take a wee look down over there and see if that's what I think it is. But I hope that's not what you think it is, really, do. Hello. Is that the Larne Police? We're here in the Akaboy Road. Um, there's a body in the river. You uh, went out on the 19th of October for an evening out. And uh, he never returned. As the weeks went past, we... You know, we, we were clutching at straws, really. I got a phone call to say that there was a body found uh, in the glens of Antrim. And at that point, we didn't know, but it sounded very like Q. Q lived, lived a, a very quiet life in Carrick. Uh, his three passions were motor scooters, supporting the football team in the running, and that was it. Every night he went out for a run. Q ran 30 marathons and his latest charity was Stillborn Children and he had booked to go to the Dublin Marathon that would have, which would have been his 31st and he never made it. Nightlife is pub life in Carrick Fergus and there are many to choose from. He rarely went to the central bar and didn't know many of the regulars but a work friend, Marty, had suggested they meet there. Cheers love, thanks. Many of the people who were around that night have taken part in this reconstruction. A lot of people liked him. They all said he was a nice guy and kind. He'd always be bantering and joking and uh, generally keeping everyone going. Over here and tell this. Over to Dobbins or Onis? Onis or Onis? Onis, let's go. I'm going to get a text up that pheasant bar. Right. I'm going to come with us. All right. All right, fair enough. Okay. Come on, you. Hurry up. I'm coming. Hugh drew a few pounds from a cash point in High Street. Then he and the others strode off to the Joy Mount Arms, a pub known locally as Owenies. Again, it's a bar Hugh didn't normally go to. Four pints of Carlsberg, pint of please. Thank you. How long did he stay there for? Four years. Four years. Brilliant place. He did all his travelling. He came home to Ireland to settle down uh, from Australia. And that was his goal, to settle down and have children. <laughs> Hugh booked a taxi for later to take him home. Taxi, book for later on. There's Cameron. Half twelve. Oh, you close one. You close one, no, make it one. Where are you going to? I'm going to Henley. All right, cheers, Bill, thanks. Who's the part playing up the stairs? That's luscious. Is that good? Yeah, all right. How much are your tickets? Three pint I give us two. Me and Marty will be well into that. He's going up, eh? You're not going up, no? No, mate, I'm going to sit here and drink McGuinness. Let's go and get some lead. Yeah, hey, go to the store. Chinese. Fancy Chinese? No. No, I mean, I'm gonna, I've made my taxi book for one. So oh, I'm right. No problem, man. All right. Yeah, no problem. Sure, we'll see you Listen, again. Good to see you. And yep. Yeah. Pleasure. Yep. 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 Take it easy. All, All right. All right. See you soon. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Taxi for Cameron. Hugh wasn't known here at Owenies, so maybe he just wasn't told that the taxi was there. Or perhaps he was in the backyard. At any rate, he didn't emerge, and eventually the cab left without him. No worries. Time now, please. Some of the people you're watching now were here at the Joy Mount Arms that night. But we need to trace the others, especially those in the backyard where people go to make mobile phone calls. 
Did anyone see Hugh? Or anyone with him? It looked like he was waiting for somebody. But maybe not. A few minutes later, he was out at the front, and we don't know what happened after that. Did someone give him a lift? Where to? Did he upset someone? Why? Sometime after 4.30 in the morning, he was stabbed, hit over the head, and had his throat cut. The pathologist thought at least two killers were involved. There may be a clue in where he was dumped, most likely from the Kapana Bridge, a remote spot on the Starbog Road. Every day I see a runner, I think of Ku. I see him running along the road. Uh, I see a man on a motor scooter, I think of Ku. Uh, when I hear anyone talking about marathons, I think of Ku. And I didn't realise how much I care for him. Well, Pat, given that this is Northern Ireland, one thing we didn't mention in the film is, is whether there's any paramilitary connection. He wasn't involved in anything like that, was he? There's no evidence whatsoever that, uh, this, A, that this was a paramilitary murder, or B, that Hugh Cameron was involved in paramilitary activity of any kind, or indeed drug dealing, drug usage, or criminality of any kind whatsoever. So what was the motive? Six months into this inquiry, we do not know what the motive was. We don't know who killed Hugh Cameron, we don't know why they killed him, and we don't know where they killed him. What we do know is he, he came upon a brutal death. Uh, he had been savagely attacked, he'd been stabbed, he'd been bludgeoned, and I'm sorry to have to say that there is evidence to suggest that he was tortured prior to his death. Well, there, you have got one very good clue, haven't you, which is, which is paint that was found on his jumper. We have paint retrieved from the rear of Hugh Cameron's jumper, which we believe is inextricably linked to the manner in which he met his death. It's a, it's a lilac-coloured paint, it's a vinyl silk emulsion, it's been applied with some force, in other words, something with that paint on it has hit Hugh Cameron hard, or Hugh Cameron has hit something painted that colour hard. By that I'm talking about potentially a wall, a radiator, a shelf, or some source of and that. And presumably, if say, say he hit a wall, for example, there would be blood stains on that wall. The nature of Hugh Cameron's injuries are such that uh, there's likely to be a significant amount of blood spilt, both in a room, if indeed that's what it was, on a wall of that colour, um, on the floor, was carpet changed, was a wall repainted, and indeed on the clothing of, of the person or the people who killed you. And, and in fact, he fought back against them, didn't he? he so did. he, he could have injured them. There's clear evidence that he fought back, and the, the people who killed him may well have been carrying injuries around the 20th of October of last year. And where he was, where his body was dumped, it's a pretty remote spot, isn't it? He was recovered from, uh, from convenient to the Skay Bridge. However, we believe his body actually went into the water at Kapana Bridge. It's some seven miles northwest of Larne. It's very remote. Uh, we believe that whoever dumped his body there must have had a connection with that area, uh, be it in their history or presently. We believe they must have been connected to that area. OK, well, there's one other thing as well. A lot of people who, who were at the pub that night, it was the Joy Mount Arms, Joy Mount wasn't Arms. it? Uh, a lot of people who came, f uh, who were in the pub that night were actually in our reconstruction, as we said, but there's still some people that the police still want to hear from, people who are in the yard, the beer garden at the back, or people who were out at the front. We still want to hear from you. Give the police a call. You know, everyone says that he was just a regular guy. Why on earth would someone want to kill him? Call us here in the studio or the instant room. That's on 02828 272. Two but let's hear some more cases now where Cranbridge calls have made a difference. Police needed to speak to Luke Avery in connection with a stabbing. We showed his face last November. He knew he'd been on Crime Watch, so when he was stopped in a routine police check, he gave a false name. But police became suspicious and arrested him. He's been found guilty of wounding and has been sentenced to nine months. This shady customer was wanted for an armed bank robbery in North London. We showed him crime much last year. Here he is again, without the sunglasses, when he got convicted last month. Thanks to the Crime Watch viewers who told us his name was Alan Weddup and he lived in Hayes in Middlesex. He was found guilty of robbery and was sentenced to two years. When elderly women are robbed and attacked, there's widespread revulsion. And when mugging becomes murder, there's outrage. So it's surprising that our next case didn't really make the headlines. This one's a year old. But in South London, kids are still covering up for their friends. And if any of them does the decent thing tonight and calls, he or she could earn a big reward. 21 years I've known Hilda. Uh, since I lived here, I moved in 1981. 
Hilda was a very determined person. She went to see her husband, Ted, every day in the nursing home at Union Road. I used to walk round the paper shop and get Hilda and paper every day and deliver it to her by half past eight. And you know, I went, had a cup of tea and a biscuit with Hilda, then I was left at by nine o'clock. On Monday the 30th of April last year, Richard went with Hilda to the shops, but he came home while she stayed on to pick up some dry cleaning. And the next time I see Hilda, she was laying outside at the bottom of her stairs, injured. Hilda came back from shopping at lunchtime. She later told Richard that she'd passed two 15 or 16 year olds on the ramp leading to Langport House. She said two black youths had attacked her at the top of the stairs and threw her down and her head hit the bottom wall at the bottom of the stairs. Then they took her bag and whatever in the pockets, a bus pass and everything, and I, I, I didn't know it was ill until I got to her. And she said to me, why me? Why me, Richard? I said, I don't know. Yolda died on her 86th birthday at half past six on, in the evening. I went to the hospital at half past ten in the morning, took some flowers and cards. Her bag was dumped, but they stole a small amount of cash, her bus pass and her Tesco loyalty card. Let me tell you a little bit about Hilda. She lived in Brixton since 1939. She was a school dinner lady until well into her 60s. She didn't have any children of her own, but she doted on her nephews and nieces. Look, this is her with her great niece in this photo here. If you know who killed her, the number's up there. Give us a call. Well, now our resident real-life detectives, Jeremy Payne and Jackie Hames. John and Thomas Connors, a father and son who failed to appear at court in Worksop in connection with the burglary on the home for the elderly. Now, they're originally from Ireland, but could now be anywhere, and they could be using other names. And these two are wanted in connection with a violent kidnapping last year, which lasted for four days. Now, you couldn't miss 22-year-old Fabian Fatinikin. He's six foot six tall. And Leckland Caby, he's also 22, and they both come from North London. Have you seen this couple? Karen Hatt and Paul Smith are wanted over a series of thefts and deceptions. They've both both held responsible positions in accounts departments, but now the companies want to speak to them about missing cheques. Although based in the North East, they're known to travel all around the UK. If you're a pub landlord, you might want to take a close look at this man. Kevin Bell has been employed on several occasions as a barman, but then he mysteriously disappears. Strangely, so do some of the takings. He uses several aliases, but won't be able to lose the distinctive Maori-type tattoos on his upper arms and the Celtic band tattoo on his finger. We also want to talk to Stephen Todd about the large-scale distribution of cocaine within the UK and the mass production of illicit tablets. Now, he's looking harmless enough in this picture, but please don't approach him. Just call us, 0500 600 600. This next man could be one of Britain's most prolific sex offenders. West Midlands police have brought in a crime analyst to highlight patterns in his behaviour. See if you can identify him tonight. There was just no sound on them roads. And I don't know what came into my mind, but I knew something was going to happen to me that night. I could feel it in, in my bones. Walking to work, and that, that's when I still worry about it. I, I just convince myself that everyone I see looks like him. I'm paranoid now. The green dots mark out the attacks. Since at least 1988, woman after woman has come forward from the small area of Chelmsley Wood near Solihull in Birmingham. Of all of the exposures and indecent assaults that have happened there, 27 are connected. That means that 27 offences are connected to one man. This one man is taking up almost 50% of our caseload in some months. The oddest thing about him is he never offends in the summer, and only four of his offences are in the spring or autumn. It's very unusual that he's committing offences only during the winter, and it's particularly remarkable that he commits most of his offences during November and December, as is apparent from the graph. This may be because he's a seasonal worker and is away from Birmingham during the summertime. Equally, he could live away from Birmingham and be visiting during the winter period. 
there was just a certain smell that he smelled as if he hadn't had a wash for ages. And he's confident he's not afraid of the police catching him. He's, he's quite sure that he can get away with it. He's reckless, except for one thing. He almost always attacks in the dark. It's important for us to establish why the offender offends first thing in the morning and then later in the afternoon. And there are two approaches we can take here. The first one's in relation to the victim. I think that the victims are making their way to school or college or work first thing in the morning, and so maybe on their own or traveling in pairs, and exactly the same things happening in the afternoon. Equally, the second explanation is to do with the offender himself, and this is about his accessibility to leave the house during these particular periods of time. All the attacks reported here have been in Chelmsley Wood and Smith's Wood, all within a 10-minute walk of each other. The offender uses his excellent knowledge of this very usual suburban area to commit his offences. He uses alleyways to sneak around, and he certainly demonstrated this in one offence where he exposed himself to the victim and then sped along a little alleyway and appeared in front of the victim later on. There was this strange-looking man on the corner of the alleyway. I thought, oh, my God, I've got a pervert here. He, he, he's going to attack me. That it was just the way he was looking at me that said it all. He grabbed me from behind and he stuck his hands down my trousers, up my, up my top, masturbated on me. His voice was quite rough, common, like rummy. I felt very nervous, very scared, dirty and worthless. Four women recalled enough to make e-fits and they all looked very similar. So maybe his specs are a disguise. These four efforts clearly show the way in which the victims perceive the offender. One of the things that's really noticeable is that one of the efforts, the offender isn't wearing glasses. We need to ask ourselves the question here why that is. What we see is his offences in 1998, he's not wearing glasses. But when he starts offending again in the winter of 1999, he is wearing glasses. He also has, on occasion, used a knife while committing his offences, and this is particularly worrying. There's no reason for us to believe that he'll stop offending, and this is a concern both to the police and to the community. So the thing that we really know about this man is that he's got an excellent local knowledge. He can navigate the alleyways and the streets incredibly well. He wears a hooded jacket that he pulls around his face. He's got large glasses that cover a large part of his face. He also has a deep, gruff voice. In my mind, I thought, I'm going to be raped, I'm going to be killed. I could be both. I thought I'd never see my son again. I think if you saw him, you know, you might be aware because he just looked the typical pervert stereotype. There's a part of me that does feel sorry for him because I don't know what's gone on in, in his background or what's happened to him. But he just needs help. He really, really needs help. I'm sure he does, but first he needs to be caught. Call us here or 0121 712 6198. When you think about it, who'd be a drugs mule? The risks of swallowing bagfuls of cocaine are so well known that people have to be very stupid, pretty ignorant or very desperate to do it. But this woman did. Her body was found by workmen at the side of the M45 in Northamptonshire. Chris Cross, tell us about her. Well, post-mortem examination reveals her to be a mother. She is 60 or over 60. Uh, she's five foot three inches tall. So quite short. She's quite short. She's 72 kilos. She's so. size 16, so she's slightly plumpish. Um, she has uh, gingerish hair extensions, and she's going gray at the front of the sides and the hair extensions are so hiding slightly a scar above her left eye. And I think that scar, together with a mole under her right nostril on her top lip, are fairly distinctive to somebody that will know her. They certainly are. She had 10 bags of cocaine inside her when she was found. Now, the other thing that's distinctive, I know a lot of her possessions had been sort of desperately taken off her before she was dumped, because people were trying to disguise she who she was. stripped of all, anything that might lead to her identification. Except this. Apart from that top. Now, tell us about this. I mean, this is a, this is a Tom Boker top. This would have cost 
Yeah, five, six hundred quid when new. Together with the skirt that that model, that style would have been sold with, would be over six hundred pound. And that style, the long style, sold with a skirt, there are only ten of them ever sold. What, size 16? Size in 16. In the world? In the world. So if you've got a size 16 one of these, ever had a size 16 one of these, we really need to know about it. Please give us a call here, give us uh, a call right away, 0500 600 600. We're getting a lot of interesting calls on the Millie Downer case. Uh, one very good call of someone who thinks they may have found her purse. Now, if you remember, someone thought they may actually have found her purse before, but uh, this certainly, I've got it here, certainly does sound extremely promising. Uh, getting a few crank calls on that too. It's such, as Nick said, it's such a serious case. If you really think you have valuable information, do give us a call. But otherwise, you're really just wasting the officer's time. We've only got several names now on the great uh, Harwood attack, several names of people who are said to fit the EFITs, in one case very, very profoundly indeed. We've got two reports of very, very similar uh, MOs, people doing the same sort of thing. We've got uh, three separate people giving the same name for the guy who did the uh, pretend uh, postman, rather violent robbery in Elstree. Uh, interestingly, the address that's given is way out of the area. Uh, we've had some other local names, but three giving the same one is, is absolutely fascinating. And on the Liverpool rape, uh, somebody says they think they found the handbag that uh, I showed. I think it's pretty improbable, but certainly we'll be looking into that. On the whole, it's, it's been very busy tonight. The calls are still coming in. It's still very difficult to assess uh, uh, how good the rest of the information is. But, of course, we'll be bringing you some more information later on this evening. Yes, our phone lines are open till midnight tonight and all day tomorrow and Friday. We'll be back at 10.35 with Crime Watch Update. We've shown uh, worse crimes tonight than most police officers encounter in a whole career. Do bear that in mind. And don't have nightmares, at least not on our account. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.